All right. Hi, John. How are you? I'm good, Douglas. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So you've got a book out called America's Original Sin. Uh, how long has the book been out? Uh, it was released on September 7th, so it's been out a week or two, I guess. Oh, very there's new. Been, yeah. There's been one review already in the Wall Street Journal, but that's all. Okay. What did the Wall Street Journal have to say about it? They said, um, they said it was a, uh, a unique and original contribution to Lincoln bibliography and that it, it contained, um, I'm paraphrasing, of course, that it contained a memorable character. Of, uh, it was a positive review, let's just say that. This is not a fictional book. This is a historical sort of rewrite, if you will. Exactly. It's, it's a, a factual book. There's no fiction involved. It's a, an account of the Lincoln assassination through a lens of white supremacy and racism. It's also, in a sense, it's a dual biography of Lincoln and Booth. It shows, I start tracing each of their lives in their childhoods and show how their trajectories converge and eventually intersect in, in death at Ford's Theater on April 14th, 1865, as Lincoln moved toward emancipation and civil rights for African Americans. Booth, who was a white supremacist and a supporter of the South, became more and more enraged until he, he reached the point where he was willing to kill. Now, it's worth pointing out that there were hundreds of thousands of white men in the United States, in America then, in both the North and the South, who would have been happy to kill Lincoln if it were not for the consequences. We think of Lincoln as this sort of uh, secular saint in our civic religion, the great martyr statesman. But at the time, during his presidency, Lincoln was the most controversial and the most hated president in American history. And his most hated act was emancipation. So Booth, Booth was a white supremacist, but white supremacy was quite different then because today I believe and I hope that most uh, that white supremacy is an extremist ideology, that the followers are few and that most Americans abhor white supremacists. But to the contrary, during the Civil War era, many, if not most white people in the North as well as the South were white supremacists. Well, I would agree with that. And I would agree that that was something that wasn't just exclusive to the United States. I would suggest that Europe was that way as well. Yeah, I think that's true. It was the whole, particularly the English speaking Europeans, um, the British and the Americans thought they had, well, just a little bit later, maybe that's more around the turn of the century. But yes, uh, the science of the day had proven that people of color were inferior to Northern Europeans. Uh, it was a pseudoscience, of course, but, but the consensus then was that this was true. This was believed by statesmen and politicians and editors and clergymen and professors and scientists and so forth. A belief in white supremacy was, was quite widespread at the time. Well, sure. And I would, I would even argue that it wasn't just the English. I mean, the Dutch who went uh, to South Africa were certainly sure. white supremacists. Uh, the yeah. Nazi Germans were certainly white supremacists. So I think it was prevalent in many countries in Europe as well as in the United States. And I hope, like you said, that it's, it's no longer considered a mainstream ideology, that it is a, an extreme ideology. But what you're saying is that back then, at the time of the Civil War, that it was more of a mainstream ideology? It was more of a mainstream ideology, although many people in the North were perfectly willing to fight for emancipation after that became one of the Union's war aims two years into the war. But that didn't necessarily mean that they uh, were friends to African Americans or that they believed African Americans were their equals. But Booth was uh, particularly um, fervent about this and he became more and more enraged as, uh, as the war went against the South and he began conspiring to 
kidnap Lincoln, presumably, and then he abandoned the kidnapping scheme and decided he would kill Lincoln and try to kill a number of the members of Lincoln's uh, uh, cabinet, including Secretary of uh, State Seward, who was badly wounded by an, another assassin, uh, Secretary of War Stanton, Lieutenant General U.S. Grant, uh, Vice President Andrew Johnson. He felt that if the, the Vice President the, the president, vice president, and secretary of state were all killed, it would induce governmental chaos. Uh, the order of secession now in the, for the presidency is uh, vice president and then, and then um, speaker of the house. But in those days, it went from vice president to the secretary of state. So he would have killed the top three people in the administration and basically decapitated the government of the United States. How many people were shot at Ford's Theater that night, aside from Lincoln? Only one, Abraham Lincoln. There was, okay, maybe I misread that, but I thought somebody in the lower tier of the audience was also targeted or shot, no? No, no. Booth had, a, had one pistol and it was a single shot pistol. Once he fired it, he was out of bullets. He worked with a knife after that, but no one else was killed uh, or, or shot. Uh, at the same time Lincoln was shot, Secretary of State William Seward, who was bedridden from a carriage accident, was attacked by another of uh, Booth's conspirators, uh, Lewis Powell, and badly wounded with a Bowie knife. Oh, I see. But he wasn't at the, th he, where was he, at home? or? No, he, he was at home on Lafayette Square near the White House. He'd been badly injured in a carriage accident a few days before, so he was in bed. Um, I actually came across the knife that was used in the Seward assassination attempt. It was in the it was in the manuscript stacks of the Huntington Library, but no one had it wasn't lost, but no one knew what it was. And I came across that about thirty years ago and identified it. It's illustrated in my book. What uh, what inspired you to write this book? Oh, I've been working with the Lincoln assassination for quite some time. Um, actually, I've, I've kept company with John Wilkes Booth for longer than Booth was alive. He only lived 26 years, and I've been working on it over 30. Uh, in 1997, I published a collection of Booth's writings. I've done exhibitions at the Lincoln Museum on the assassination. Um, I've been working on it for quite a while. And there have been in that time a number of good books on the assassination published, uh, a handful anyway. But um, my, my approach is quite different because of the white supremacy and because I, I embed the story of the assassination so much in the history of the Civil War and the history of emancipation. Most of the other treatments of the Lincoln assassination have been sort of done like they're fine books, but they've been done more like detective stories, just concentrating on on Booth and his conspiracy. OK, so in total, how many people were known to be conspiring with Booth at the time of the assassination? He had kind of a whole crew with him, didn't he? He, he had a crew. They caught uh, they caught uh, about six of them. There were known to be others. Someone tried to get to uh, General Grant, U.S. Grant, uh, on a train trip he was taking the same night Lincoln was assassinated. Couldn't get into his railroad car, but tried. And so that's someone who's never been identified. There were members of the conspiracy that have never been identified. But a number were tried and four were hanged by the neck until dead on July 7th, not long after the assassination. And one of those condemned is notable, uh, Mary Surratt, because it was the first time a woman had ever been hanged by the United States of America. What did she do? What did Mary Surratt do? Well, her son was uh, Booth's right-hand man. He was a Confederate spy, uh, took his orders directly from Jefferson Davis in Richmond. But she ran a boarding house on H Street in um, in Washington, D.C. It's still there. It's a Chinese restaurant today, at least the bottom floor is. And that was sort of a Confederate safe house in the national capital. All the conspirators met there and so forth. Um, so she was she knew about the plot. 
I think they were also frustrated because they couldn't find her son, John. He wasn't captured till 1867. But uh, there was sufficient evidence to convict her. Uh, of course, it was a military tribunal, not a jury of her peers. But they had sufficient evidence to convict her, and they did go ahead and carry out the execution. It was thought that the president, who was then Andrew Johnson, would commute her sentence to life imprisonment. And the commission that sentenced her to death asked him to do that, but he declined to do so. And so she was hanged with the other three. So her her crime was aid and abetting? Aiding and abetting. And she gave instructions to uh, a tavern keeper in Maryland to have things ready for Booth the night of the assassination when he came by on his escape out of town. Uh, so yeah, aiding and abetting. Uh -huh. And and knowledge. She was she was part of the conspiracy. We've got time for one of your talking points here. I just wanted I'm curious about this one. It was number five on your sheet. It says pushback from traditional historians who have not named white supremacy as the motivation for Lincoln's assassination. Assassination. Why would they push back on this when it seems like a fairly obvious motivation. Yes, uh, I haven't seen that talking point. Uh, there's been no pushback. Uh, historians have accepted for uh, a long time that white supremacy was one of Booth's motivations. It's just that the general public doesn't seem to have gotten that idea, just as the general public doesn't accept that slavery is the cause of the war. But in terms of the historical profession, uh, I make no claims to originality here. And there has been, and I'm sure will be, no pushback from from historians. So I uh, I disavow that talking <laughs> Okay. I, say. I didn't write it. Oh, all right. I don't know who wrote it, but okay. Well, that's fine. Um, where is all this information available? Where'd you find it all? It's mostly in published sources because, uh, but it comes from uh, War Department files. They interviewed huge numbers of people they arrested huge numbers of people. Anybody who had anything to do with Booth got thrown in prison, even if they thought he wasn't guilty. If they thought he'd make a valuable witness, they threw him in prison. Anyway, there, there are reams and reams of testimony, interviews from these various uh, people that were either witnesses or involved. And uh, that's available on microfilm. A lot of it has also been published now. But as I say, I've been studying this for over 30 years. Well, we do have to wind this down. Do you have a website that you want to give out? No, I'm going to have to get one, but I don't have one. I have an Amazon authors page. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing. And uh, we'll put up the, the photo of the book and tell people to go to Amazon.